So now that we've had a chance to look at the implementation of template method in the context of C++, let's go ahead and kind of wrap up with other considerations, the pros, the cons, the implementation decisions, and so on. So let's talk about the good stuff first. So some of the consequences that are positive, that are benefits, this pattern really enables inversion of control. And that's why it's so popular in object-oriented frameworks, because they're based on inversion of control, which is the, the Hollywood principle. Don't call us, we'll call you. And as you can see here, if you were to kind of poke under the hood a little bit, the reactor runs an event loop, which will basically call handle input, which will then start the wheels in motion to prompt the user, receive the input, make the command, and execute the command. So the reactor is calling back to the event handler's handle input method, which is classic example of inversion of control. So the reactor runs the event loop for the framework. We register the event handler, and then that's what makes everything go ahead and run. Some of the nice things about this pattern is it helps to enforce the overriding rules using subclassing. So anytime you want to change the behavior of one of the hook methods, you just have to make a subclass and, and override it. So it's very structured, very stylized. Once you know the pattern, there's no real surprise ever. Another nice thing, which is really the main reason we apply this pattern in, in the context of our expression tree processing app, is it promotes systematic reuse by collapsing stovepipes. So rather than having one set of code for verbose mode, and then a completely different set of code for succinct mode. Instead, we have a lot of code in common, the reusable code, and then we have the variant part, which is the non-reusable code. And, and the non-reusable code is really just the make command method for each of those different modes and the prompt user method for each of those modes, but everything else is shared. And uh, this is really valuable. Now, this is a very simple example, admittedly, but when you start getting more complicated examples, you really start to appreciate the benefits of this refactoring into common uh, base class template methods and then doing selective overriding in subclasses. If you want more discussions about reuse, take a look at the article down below, which was some musings of mine a really long time ago, probably 25 years ago or so, about reuse and systematic reuse. And I think most of those musings are still appropriate today by, by and large. Some of the technologies have changed a bit, but the overall themes are very similar. So what are some of the consequences? You, uh, you'll you need to use, what are some of the negative consequences? You need, to re you need to subclass in order to specialize behavior. And as a consequence, you can end up with a lot of subclasses. Now, in, in our particular example here, not a big deal. We had a couple of methods that needed to be customized. We had two modes, verbose mode and succinct mode. Wasn't very hard to do. Uh, but when you end up with, say, you know, 10 hook methods, each of which can vary in 13 different ways, you can end up with a combinatorial explosion of subclasses. And that can get very unwieldy in a hurry. And it's worth comparing, contrasting the approach that the template method does with the strategy pattern approach. And we'll, we'll talk about that explicitly in just a minute. One way to get rid of this tedium is to use C++ Lambda functions. So that's a common way nowadays to get around of having to make lots of subclasses. In fact, you've been seeing examples of this in our assignments and the examples we've looked at in class when we've talked about using Lambda functions in lieu of making custom functors. And you can think of custom functors as basically sort of statically bound template methods. They're really more strategies, but same idea. You don't actually have to make separate classes for these things. You can just pass in anonymous chunks of C++ behavior and code in the form of Lambda functions, and, and then they do the work that you otherwise would have had to have defined classes uh, with in the earlier days of C++. Some other interesting implementation considerations. Do you want to have virtual methods for your template method? Do you want to have non-virtual or, or in what's called Java's final methods for template methods? And uh, if, if it's defined as virtual, then that means you can change the template method itself if you have a different set of steps you need, for example. If you make it non-virtual or, or final in Java, that means you can't change the template method. You're stuck with whatever the steps were. And of course, the, the obvious decision point here is, do you ever anticipate the algorithm and its steps changing? 
If the answer is yes, then make it virtual. If the answer is no, then you can make it non-virtual. In my experience, I typically make my template methods virtual uh, just because you never know when you might need to change them. So you're better off future-proofing your design by not programming yourself into a corner and making it non-virtual. It, it really doesn't harm you at all to make it virtual. And in fact, if it's being called back in the context of a framework like the reactor, you need it to be virtual. Some other considerations that I alluded to earlier is this choice between few hook methods versus many hook methods. You know, how many hook methods do you need? Do you need one? Do you need 50? And the answer, of course, really comes down to how much variability do you need to have in the template methods algorithm? So here, I think it was pretty appropriate to have four methods, prompt user, receive input, make command, and execute command. But in other situations, you might you know, need fewer. In fact, you notice we didn't change receive input and we didn't change execute command. So maybe we only needed two of these things. But I think um, had we done a more interesting example with maybe multiple threading or input that comes in from other sources other than a reactor, like a file or a network or whatnot, then we probably would have appreciated the fact that we left those hook methods in our design of the actual superclass or abstract base class because it gave us more flexibility and freedom down the, down the way. Other kind of mundane issues, what do you call the hook methods? Are they do? Are they make? Are they on? You'll notice that in my case, I didn't follow any of those conventions. I just called them prompt user, receive input, make command, and execute command. Um, if you look at a lot of frameworks these days, especially Android, they typically have the, the hook methods called on. So like on start, on stop, on pause, on resume, on create, on destroy, all that good stuff, on pre-execute, on post-execute, on uh, you know post-progress or whatever. Those are all examples of hook methods in Android. And um, your, your mileage may vary. Some people like to follow a convention. Some people like to have the names be intuitive based on the domain. So you're welcome to follow whatever makes the most sense to you, but probably a good idea to be consistent. Don't call some things on and some things do unless there's a good reason to differentiate them semantically. There are lots and lots and lots of known uses. The Gang of Four book lists a whole bunch back from kind of the early days of frameworks and object-oriented design circa early to mid 80s. Uh, Java has a bunch of examples. The AWT toolkit, for example, uses a template method all over the place. The uh, C++ middleware that I've built over the last three decades called ACE and the ACE orb or DAO, they use template method very heavily. You can take a look at this article in the link below for more information about how to do template method in the context of, of ACE, for example, that uses C++. Uh, Java has lots of examples of this. The, the Java collections framework uses template method for many of the collection behaviors. Here you can see the set method that's defined on an abstract sequential list has something called list iterator, which is a hook method that can be overridden by concrete subclasses like linked list and so on to make different kinds of iterators. Uh, one of my favorite examples of the template method pattern is actually an Android and part of Android's concurrency frameworks called the Android async task framework. And in this case, you have this class called async task, which has a template method called execute. And then it's got a bunch of hook methods on pre-execute, on progress update, on post execute, do in background. The on methods all run in the main thread of control. The do method runs in a background thread. And then you can come along and subclass from async task in order to make your async task that provides custom behavior for the different hook methods to do something before the task starts to run, to do something in the background when it's running in its own thread and then to do something once the in the user interface thread or the foreground thread once the background processing is done. Uh, if you have a chance to take my course on concurrent object-oriented programming, I will talk about the async task class most likely at some point along the way. So I mentioned before kind of comparing and contrasting strategy with template method. Strategy is really a uh, more of a black box oriented pattern. You, you can plug in objects, you can plug in you know, very simple, very shallow inheritance hierarchy uh, implementations that allow for 
composition of strategies at runtime in a plug and play like manner. And you can flexibly mix and match features. If you go back and watch the video about the, the strategy pattern that we use to make our different traversal strategies for the iterators, that's a good example of strategy pattern. Um, you may end up with a lot of strategy classes, although once again, Lambda functions can help with that or Lambda expressions and method references in Java, same basic idea. Um, if you want to learn more about what a black box mechanism is, take a look at the link at the bottom of this, this uh, page. It talks about black box versus white box frameworks, and it's really interesting. In contrast, template method uh, uses really uses inheritance as opposed to this kind of pluggability by object composition approach. And it works very well for simple use cases like our example we did here with uh, succinct mode versus verbose mode. But in more complicated use cases, it has some downsides. And those downsides are you've got to closely couple the subclasses with the superclass, which can get annoying. The inheritance hierarchies are static and can't be reconfigured at runtime. So plugging and playing is more complicated. And anytime you find yourself with a lot of inheritance, you can end up with a combinatorial explosion of subclasses. Again, if you've got a, an abstract base class with you know, five hook methods, and each of those hook methods can have 16 different variabilities, then you've got a very large number of subclasses to cover all the bases. And that's just not scalable in a lot of ways, where strategy doesn't lead you in the same direction. Uh, another thing, just as a general rule of thumb, to be violated if you know what you're doing, you should try to keep your inheritance hierarchies fairly shallow. Um, two, maybe three levels, much beyond that, you're, you're probably doing something wrong and you should go over and use uh, other mechanisms like strategies in order to parameterize things as opposed to inheriting everything. Now, again, you know, obviously it depends on your domain. So I remember one time I was giving that bit of advice and then I talked about the expression tree uh, composite structure, which has component node and uh, composite unary node and composite binary node. And someone called me out on that and said, oh, well, that's got, you know, more than two levels of inheritance. And uh, while that is sort of the case, it all depends on how you look at it. Uh, that's a good example where the domain lent itself to having, you know, three levels, but we didn't have 30 levels. And uh, that's also a difference kind of between the older style of object-oriented programming and object-oriented design as embodied with older languages like Smalltalk, which typically had very deep inheritance hierarchies. And even Java, in many ways, with older Java, like the Java Collections Framework, very deep inheritance hierarchies with more modern techniques, such as C++ STL, which has little or no inheritance and instead uses other techniques like parameterization in order to be able to get customization. And remember, we talked about when we talked about the, the strategy pattern, you can think about using parameterized types as a form of the strategy pattern. So that's a good example of how generic programming in C++ is more strategy oriented than template method oriented, whereas object oriented programming in C++ often lends itself more to template method programming. And of course, my advice is to pick and choose the best of breed for these different paradigms in order to get the most out of what you're doing. One way to look at strategy versus template method is as so-called pattern complements since they provide alternative solutions to related design problems. We won't have time probably, well, I guarantee we will not have time today to cover the concept of pattern complement in its most uh, uh, effectively and thorough description and discourse. But what I'm most likely to do is I'm gonna continue making videos about patterns and I'll cover more Gang of Four patterns and I'll post them up on my, my YouTube channel. So if anybody wants to keep going even though we're done with the class, I'll, I'll keep posting those videos and you're welcome to, to follow along. So to summarize, the template method pattern is applied here to give us controlled variability in our expression tree processing app via the ET event handler superclass and the handle input template method, thereby making it possible to have multiple operating modes which enables systematic reuse. So it's a very clean, very concise way of being able to do those things. And you can also see, just looking at this diagram, that uh, template method fits in with all the other patterns. So we have factory method to make the user command. 
we have the command pattern, we have the state pattern, we have the composite pattern, and so on and so forth. And so once again, you know, rem always remember that patterns are not islands. Patterns are social. They like to interact with other patterns. And if you can really understand that, you'll be well on your way to mastering what patterns are and how to apply them effectively to lots of things down the road, not just to the program we're working on now for assignment number five.